You are listening to Rabbi Arya Wolby of Torch in Houston, Texas. This is the Thinking Talmudist Podcast. All right, welcome back, my dear friends, to the Thinking Talmudist series. Today, we're going to continue the Talmud in Tractate Shabbat 31a. We talked the past two weeks about the greatness of Hillel. Now we're going to continue to talk about the greatness of Hillel, but we're going to see a very interesting story about someone who was trying to pursue conversion and his story. So this is the third narrative that, we've, that we're talking about since we started this Talmud. Shuv Maisa ben There was another incident involving a certain Gentile, Shahaya over Achore Beis Hamidrash, who was once walking past the back of the study hall. He was walking past the study hall. Vishama Kol Sofer Shahaya Omer. He hears the teacher, the Rebbe, teaching the, the children in the classroom. Ve'ele habigodim ashayasu choshen ve'efod. These are the vestments that they shall make, a breastplate and an aphod. This is in Exodus 28, verse 4. And the verse describes the various majestic garments made for Aaron, the high priest, to wear during his performing of the service in the tabernacle. And we know in this uh, past week, in the in, last week in the Torah portion, and this week we're going to read in Baha'u'llah, we're talking about the menorah, and last week we talked about the traveling and all of the uh, transportation of the tabernacle, its beams and its its uh, vessels and everything that's in it. And this is now the portion that's talking in Exodus when we were talking about the creation of the vestments. So here this non-Jew is walking by the study hall. He hears this rabbi talking to his students and teaching him, teaching the students about the vestments of the Kohen Gadol. Omar, the Gentile, stopped and said to the class, Halalulami, these lavish garments, who are they for? Amru, the students, replied to him, La Kohen Gadol, these are for our Kohen Gadol, for our high priest. Amar also Nachri Ba'atzmo, upon hearing this, the Gentile said to himself, I will go and convert to Judaism so that they will appoint me as the Kohen Gadol. Now, there's a little bit of a challenge here. What's the challenge? The challenge is, is that you cannot become a Kohen Gadol if you are not from the priestly family. I can want to be a Kohen Gadol every day of my life, and it's never going to happen. You know, there's a joke they say, someone once came to the rabbi, and he says, Rabbi, can you make me a Kohen? He says, I'm sorry, I can't help you. He says, Rabbi, please, come on. You know, I'll make a nice donation to your discretionary fund, you know, if you uh, if you make me a Kohen. He says, rabbi says, I'm sorry, I can't do that. It's, it's impossible. So he says, you know what, how about if I give you uh, $50,000, can you make me then a Kohen? He says, I'm sorry, I can't make you a Kohen. He says, how about $100,000? You know, I'll make it sweet enough. The rabbi will eventually uh, acquiesce. And sure enough, he keeps on going. The number keeps growing. And the rabbi's resistance is just as firm as in beginning. So the rabbi, after a while, asks the, uh, the individual, he says, if you don't mind me asking, like, why do you even want this so much? He says, what do you mean? My father was a Kohen. My grandfather was a Kohen. I also want to be a Kohen. So... All right, so so I'll tell you actually a, a, a funnier story. A friend of mine, I know who this person is, so it's not just somebody out there. It's I know who the person is. He lived in Cincinnati, and he once went to one of the uh, synagogues there, not, not an affiliated man at the time, and they were, you know, they bring out the Torah, and it's like the, the rabbi goes around, he says, any Kohen, any Kohen, Kohen, anybody Kohen? He's like, I guess they need a volunteer. So he says, me. They ask him his name, they give him, he gives him the name, and he gets the Elia. And the next week he comes back again, and they give him the Elia again for Kohen. And, you know, this is going on for years. And eventually he tells them, you know, I've been volunteering for Kohen for like seven years. I think it's time to get somebody else to volunteer for this position. And the rabbi turns white. He says, what do you mean you've been volunteering? He says, he says I, I, I mean, 
what is, I don't know what a coin is, but I mean, it's you were asking like incessantly, is there anybody here who can be a coin? So I said, me, I volunteered. I have no idea what a coin is. He says, you mean your father's not a coin? He says, I, I have no idea. Like I have like, and uh, that's the true story. So, uh, yeah. So if, if you're a rabbi of a synagogue, just ensure that your Kohen is an actual Kohen and not one that identifies as a Kohen. Yes, sir. It's fine. It's a great question. The, you have to understand that they practiced for seven days erecting and disassembling the tabernacle before it was inaugurated on Rosh Chodesh Nisan. From the 23rd day of the month of Adar, they started assembling it and disassembling it, assembling it and disassembling it every day so they learned how to do it exactly so that it was synchronized, it was fast, and that the, because the people couldn't camp their tents till the tabernacle was ready. You know, you don't just like say, oh, I'm here, I'm camping my tent and sitting with my family. So it, it was very important for them to make sure that they had this down to a science. And they did. Yeah, okay, so... Okay, so now what happens? So now, so that's that's the story about that. But just to make it easier for the transportation of all of those vessels, and not the vessels, the vessels were carried in their hands. They didn't want to put them on an animal. It would be disrespectful. You're going to put the menorah, you're going to put the, the, the laver, you're going to put all of that on an animal? Nah, that's not respectful. So the actual vessels, the ark, and all of that was carried by the Levites. They carried it themselves. So we know that they, it carried them, but that's that's what the the, the midrash teaches us that we we need to understand that these were such holy items that they didn't just like you know you don't schlep it like you schlep a, a box from Amazon you know what I mean it's not like that type of it, this these was the holiest vessels on earth. So here's the thing, as we saw at the end of last week's parsha, what happened was is that the leaders of each tribe donated wagons and oxen so that it'll be easier for them to transport all of the beams and all of the the sockets and everything else so that they can actually transport it from place to place and it's it's a very it's it's a very serious task but it was a beautiful act that these leaders of the tribes did to help the levites to assist them and they did it with all of their heart and they they contributed them to the service of the temple and moshe gave them out to each family according to what they needed to do. So if a family was carrying the bigger beams, they needed more assistance. So they got more assistance. The The, the family that was carrying the, just the drapes, the drapes were also heavy, don't forget. These were the coverings. These were massive you know, sheets of, of garments, of, of, of cloth that were covering. Uh, and it was, it was quite serious a task. These transportation tools were big, were a big assistance to them. Okay, so now, what would you say to this non-Jew who says, "I want to convert so that I can become the Kohen Gadol"? Right? You tell him, "I'm sorry, that's never going to happen." Now, it's it's an interesting thing, particularly in our generation today. Today, the the world we're living in today, June 2023, where everyone can identify as whatever they want. I can identify as a tree. I can identify as a helicopter. And I know some people are going to say that that's disparaging, and that's 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 not disparaging. Okay, it's it's a little bit of a a confusing world that we're living in, where people you know want to identify as their cat or as the dog, as whatever it is that they're that they're doing, and we have to demonstrate a level of sympathy, of of love, and feel and be concerned for people who are confused. They're confused. And I think that it's it's not something like we don't see that any of the rabbis here, this individual is is in a, living in an illusion where he thinks he's going to be the Kohen Gadol. He's about to have a rude awakening. Right? You're not the cat, and you're not the dog, and you're not the Kohen Gadol. So the narrative continues. Balifne Shammai. He comes in front of Shammai. We remember Shammai was a little bit tough. With the previous converts, one says, teach me all of Torah on, while standing on one leg. Another one says, uh, teach me Torah, only the written Torah, but not the oral Torah. And both of them, Shammai pushed them away with a stick and saying, get out of here. Hillel converts them, and Hillel finds the way, the path for them. 
So let's see what happens here. She says, Gaireini, he comes to Shammai. He says, Gaireini, I'm not sure to see many Kohen Gadol. Convert me on condition that you have me appointed as the Kohen Gadol, as the high priest. Shammai, viewing the request as preposterous, pushed the person aside with a ruler that he was holding in his hand, pushed him aside. Then this is identical to what happened last time, where he says, the foundation, what does that mean with the, with the ruler? Right, They use the ruler to measure the foundations. It was a foundation ruler. And he was telling him, just like this ruler is used for a big foundation, not for one pillar, because you can't hold the building on one pillar, you need to have it on a big foundation, so too the Torah has a big foundation, not just one pillar. You can't have it standing on one foot. But the Mar- Marsha again comments on the symbolism of Shammai's use of the construction measure to push the would-be convert away. Shammai's gesture conveyed that just as the building does not stand on a single pedestal, so too the world of Judaism does not rest on the concept of kahuna, of the priesthood. Thus, the Gentile must have a broader motivation for becoming a Jew before he could be accepted for conversion. It's not just a light thing. You come, you go, you do. It's okay. Balif Nehillel, undeterred, which again, this shows us the characteristic that is required if someone wants to convert to Judaism. It shows us a third story here, where if someone wants to convert, they're going to be pushed away and they're going to come back. They're going to be determined and undeterred. I want this and I'm going to fight for this and I'm going to do whatever it takes. So one rabbi said, no, I'm going to the next rabbi. And just because he said no doesn't mean it's no. You know, they say that no, when someone says, like, you're asking for an investor, you're asking, for, you know, to invest in your business, you're asking for finance, you come to Ascentium Capital and you say, give me some, fi- you know, can you finance my project? And they say no. So no doesn't mean no. It doesn't mean N-O. It means no, K-N-O-W. They don't know enough. If they know a little bit more, they will happily do it. But they need to know more. And the same thing here is when you say no and you say you can't convert, you can't, I'm not convert, right? And Shammai shoes him away. What he's saying is you need to know more than what you're currently espousing. You're espousing this desire to be a Kohen Gadol. It's much more than just that. Yes. You have to be born a Kohen. Your father's a Kohen. That's fine. Right, so that that's the one of the most essential parts of Judaism is knowledge. We talk about this all the time. The first key to success in Judaism is learning. You have to learn and be armed with knowledge. The problem is, and this is a very big problem, is that if we don't educate our children in their Judaism, then everything to them is a mystery, and they don't understand why, and nothing makes sense. We talk to them about Shabbos, we talk to them about Talis Tfilin, we talk to them about kosher. It's like, why? There's no so it's important. In fact, the halacha says that when a baby is able to start talking, the first thing you should say to, with the baby is Torah Tzivalanu Moshe. The Torah was commanded to us by Moshe. Morosha Kihilos Yaakov. It's an inheritance for every Jew. A child already, when they start talking, should start uttering the words of emuna. And we need to understand that children are like wet cement. The imprint that you put on that wet cement will last forever. It's like wet cement. So if you put a, a good impact, a good foundation in with a big heart and with a lot of love, that's what will be in their hearts. I was listening to a class by a noted psychologist uh, in the Jewish community, and he said something so fabulous. He was he was saying, and doctor, our in-house doctor can can uh, tell us if we're correct or wrong or or incorrect. Uh, but he said that the first two years of a baby's life have such an important role in how they are going to be throughout their entire life. Their entire life will be impacted by those two years. You're laying down those foundations. Foundation is wet. Now it's going to start drying up. 
And the confidence the child will have throughout their life is from those two years. The self-esteem that the child will have throughout their life will be from those two years. It is so important. He gave a few examples, which I thought were beautiful examples. He says, imagine you finally save up money and you have enough money to repaint your dining room. So you, you know, put fresh coat of paint on the wall and it's beautiful. It's so terrific. And the little infant is crawling around and grabs a red Sharpie and marker and starts doing their own paint on the fresh paint on the wall. So here's an infant and the infant is very delicate to your reaction. They're looking for that reaction. He says, if you yell and scream at that little baby or yell at scream and scream at the, who left this marker out? Who, who left the Sharpie, right? Then it's going to have an impact on that, on that baby. It's going to have an impact on the whole family, definitely. But if you say, one second, one second, stop right there. Pull out your camera and take a picture. And you can laugh about this. The entire picture changed now where the child realizes this is not the right thing to do. Right? We'll take away the marker, but you're not instilling that trauma potentially to that child. Okay, so now what happens? Undeterred, though, the Gentile comes before Hillel and presents him with the same request. Gaire and Hillel converted him. Amazing, right? So now the Brisa continues. Amar Lo, before performing the conversion, Hillel said to this person, can we appoint anyone as king unless he is familiar with the ceremonies of royalty? We don't just put King Charles the Third as king. We don't appoint him or anoint him as king without him knowing the process of royalty, the ceremonies of royalty. He says, Hillel says to this convert, go and learn the ceremonies of royalty, meaning learn the requirements of the kahuna, of the priesthood, and then we will see about your request. Halach v'kara. So the Gentile went and learned scripture. Kevon shehigiyao. As soon as he got to, he reached the verse that states, v'hazara korev yumas. As soon as he reads the verse in Numbers, Chapter 3, verse 10, the verse teaches that non-Kohanim, strangers, I'm a stranger, anybody else who's not a Kohen is a stranger, who perform essential elements of the sacrificial service will suffer death at the hand of heaven. So he learns this. Amar Leh, he says to Hillel, Mikrozel, Minemar, this verse, about, who, about whom is it stated? He says it is even stated about David, the king of Israel. Nasa also ger kalvachomer bats were contemplating this, that convert formulated a kalvachomer, a kalvachomer argument concerning himself, which is a light to the severe. Remember we said that a kalvachomer is like the doctor telling you don't, eat a spoon of sugar. So what do you say? He said, no, no, the doctor said a spoon, but not a cup. So I can, no, we know. If he said a spoon, that means even more so a cup. We learn from the light. We know to the more, if we know that King David can't be the Kohen Gadol, he can't be the high priest, even more so this convert can't be a Kohen Gadol. Right? He said, and if ordinary Israelites who are called children of the Almighty and out of the love that God feels towards them, he called them B'ni B'chori Yisrael, my firstborn son Israel. What does it say about them? It says about those children who Hashem refers to as our, his firstborn son. It says that if he approaches the service of the temple, he will die a death from heaven. Ger hakal shebo b'maklo u'vetarmilo al achas kamar v'kama. Then certainly a mere convert who comes into the Jewish people with his staff and traveling bag 
even more so that he is considered a, quote, stranger with respect to the kahuna, to the, to the priesthood. So what we're learning here is an amazing thing. I think it's an unbelievable Talmud giving us encouragement about converts. You feel like a stranger. Guess what? You know who's called a stranger? Anybody who's not a Kohen. So the Israelites are called strangers. The Levites, who are not part of the Kohanic families, they are also called a stranger. You feel, Mr. Convert, that you're a stranger. You're in good company. You're in good company. Everybody who's not a Kohen is called a stranger. Now, why is it called a stranger? So that it's very important for every person to know their place. It's very, very important. You know when you get in companies, when you have problems with management, is when nobody knows their place. As soon as you know this is your direct report, you are responsible to answer to this person. Now you know your place. But when you're think, you think that you're the CEO and you're not, and you're frustrated that nobody's listening to you, and you're frustrated that there's, that there's no organization here, the whole organizational structure, what's going on here, you're in the wrong seat. It's very important. And once, by the way, once you know who your direct report is, you're very happy. You could be at least. Because you know your place. You know what you're obligated to do. You know what they are expecting you to do. The commentary here says, if we look at some of the commentaries, even someone as important and honored as King David was unable to perform the sacrificial service, for this service is reserved for those who are Kohanim. Only those who are priests can do the service, a status that can be attained only by being born to a Kohen. That's it. Nobody else can do that service. And what does it mean when it says that he comes in with his staff in his traveling bag, the convert? That's it they come in with. It's that he enters as a newcomer without any special merit or impressive ancestry. This is it he has. He has the shirt on his back. That's it. And the truth is, is that our sages teach us that every single human being who's born is that exact convert. You think that because your parents were so successful, therefore you are up a notch? No, 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 no. I grew up with a great, great, special, holy grandfather. And I hope that one day I'm able to make something out of myself. But I was taught that having great lineage, having a great ancestry, is a bunch of zeros. It's your obligation as an individual to put the number in front of those zeros. And if you don't put that number in front of those zeros, it's just a bunch of zeros. Lineage is only valuable if you do something with it. We can have the most incredible parents in the world, but if we don't make something out of ourselves, then what are we? We're nothing. Just because, and by the way, it's a very big challenge today. You see children who grow up as what let's call them trust babies, who grow up with a, 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 a millionaire attitude about everything. Their parents give them whatever they want. They never had a challenge. They never had a struggle. They never had to fight to succeed. They never had to overcome challenges because everything, just buy it off. And one after another, you see the disabilities that this causes them. Because they, they, they think, I'm, I had come with all of these zeros. I'm just natural at running a good business. I'm just natural at just being at the place that my parents worked so hard or grandparents worked so hard to get to the top of that mountain. You know, it says, uh, there's a story told about the, the Gera Rebbe. The Gera Rebbe the previous Gera, Gera Rebbe, I think it was the Pnei Menachem, was his name, or what he was called, named after his book. And he became the Gera Rebbe when he was 18 years old. And many of his followers, his father passed away when he was 18 years old. So he took over the kingship, so to speak, of the big, massive Hasidic dynasty. I'm talking one of the biggest, probably the second largest. And some of the elder Hasidim 
asked him, like, isn't it odd? We're in our 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. You're a little 18-year-old boy. And you're the leader of this dynasty. So he says, let me explain to you. He says, one time there were hikers who are hiking up a mountain. And they were hiking and hiking, and it's taking them years and years to get to the top of the mountain. Years. Finally, they're six in their 60s. And they finally they're getting to the top of the mountain. They get to the top of the mountain, and what do they see? A little baby. Like, what? We're working for years and years and years to get to the top of the mountain, and this little baby got here already? So they inquire, how's this possible? The baby says, I was born at the top of the mountain. Ah, you're born at the top of the mountain. That's what lineage is. You're born at the top of the mountain. But if you don't learn how to maintain yourself at the top of the mountain, you can fall all the way down. And that's, you need, a person needs to understand and it's much more difficult, by the way, because to maintain something you never worked hard to attain, like the Gerebi saying that he's born at the top of the mountain, he doesn't understand the dangers of rocks falling from under your legs. He doesn't understand the challenge of that toil. He has different challenges, but he doesn't necessarily appreciate that challenge. And that great people, like the Rebbe from Gur, were able to then work on themselves and understand and feel and be able to guide an entire generation through challenges, even though they grew up, they were born on the top of the mountain. Yes, sir. Right. So it, it's a difficult task when someone comes into synagogue claiming that they're a Kohen. That's the rabbi's job to verify that. Now, I will tell you, that there are names that are that come from, like the name Katz, many times is Kohen Tzedek. That's where it comes from. Yeah, it comes from Kohen Tzedek. So Katz is a, is a very common uh, Kohen name. The name Kohen itself, many people, the name Kohen is uh, from the Kohanic dynasty. You also have Levites, which is Siegel. Siegel is Skan Levi, which is the Levite assistant. They got that name. So many, many of the Levites, are their name is Siegel, right? Because that's, that's where their great, great, great grandfathers, that's where they got their names from being the, uh, the Levite uh, tasks, from doing those Levite tasks, yes. The way you verify it is through looking at their ketubah or if they have a divorce document, their, their get, if they have other types of documents, that's where you really see it uh, in the cemetery. If it says that they're a Kohen, is usually an indication. Not always, especially in the past, you know, fifty years. We don't know what people put. We don't know. It's a very big challenge. I'll tell you. I'll be honest with you. I'm part of the Hevra Kadisha, and I would say that probably eight out of ten burial rituals that we do are with not knowing the the Jewish name of the father. Even the individual who passed away, they'll only know, oh, his name was Sam. But we, we assume that that may be Shmuel. We have no idea. So, my dear friends, you have many, many more years, but make sure that you have a document that has your Hebrew name, has your father's Hebrew name, your mother's Hebrew name. If you're a Kohen, if you're a Levi, have it documented in a place so that if it's, you know, if it's needed, and if you have a talus, that, that, that as well, as many people come, they don't have a talus to be, which the Hever provides, of course. But uh, if someone wants to be buried with their own talus that they've worn throughout their life, that's a very, very special thing. So, yeah, the second question. Again, th these are good questions. What do you do with someone who claims that they're either a Kohen, a Levi, or a Yisrael, or that they're Jewish, right? We don't know. So again, this is a rabbi has to be very tactful uh, to know how to do that and to how to ask it in a way that's um, conducive to getting the truth. You want to know the truth, and the, the most uh, truthful answers are not when you ask it direct. But when you have just a roundabout conversation, after we get off air, I can share with you the method that I've used. Remind me, please, and I'll, I'll share that. Okay, so now we hear what happens with Hillel. Hillel tells the guy, he says, this convert, you know what? You have to learn about the kingship before you're actually a king. 
And here this this uh, convert starts learning that the that the stranger who offers an offering in the sanctuary will be put to death. He says, who's this stranger? He says, referring to an Israelite or a Levite who both are not allowed to. They're not allowed to. So, in, so what do you do? If they can't, even more so that the convert cannot. Okay. So now this convert is having a little bit of an issue. He goes back to Shammai and he says, after coming to this conclusion, the convert came before Shammai. Amarlo, he said to him, Klum roi ani lios kohen gadol. Could I possibly have been fit to be a kohen gadol? Valoksiv batoro vazora korev yumas. Is it not written in the Torah that a stranger who approaches shall die? Balifne Hillel Amarlo. He then came before Hillel and he said to him, Anvason Hillel yonuchulcha brachas al roshcha. Hillel, the humble one, let blessings come to rest upon your head. For through your gentle and unassuming guidance, you brought me under the wings of the divine presence. There's something which is spectacular that we learn here. And that is the ways of the Torah is with pleasantness. Our job is not to be aggressive. Our job, that's not a Jewish trait that we're picking up from the world, from the Gentiles. That's not our trait. Our trait is always to be the kind, the loving, the friendly, the gentle, the patient. That's our trait. And what we see in Hillel is exactly that. Here, come. Come, let's learn a little bit about the kingship before you become a king. Learn a little bit. So he starts learning. And what happens? Starts learning. That's why we always say, and we had this many, many times in Torch, where people come and we do our little investigation. We realize very quickly that the guy's mother is not Jewish. But his father is. So do we tell him? Do we break the news to him? You know, according to the Torah, you're not Jewish? No. What we do is we learn. We invited him in to learn. And on his own, he figures this out. One second, we just learned this, we just learned that. He puts two and two together. But the amount of love that you display for the individual is what really matters. Because when it comes with this point of love, when it comes with this affection, sharing the wisdom of Hashem, sharing the beauty of the Torah, now, we don't go out and proselytize. We're not here to convert people. We're not here to, but we're definitely not here to hurt people. And Hillel demonstrates this. In our Talmud right here, Hillel demonstrates what it means to be a loving, caring, patient Jew. You don't have to break the news to him, be that guy, to tell him, just so that you know, you're disqualified. No. That's not, that's not what we need to do. The convert protests to Shammai that he should not have turned him away abruptly and without explanation. Rather, he should have explained to him that by Torah law, he would be ineligible to perform the sacrificial service even once he converted. That means you should have explained it to me. Why didn't you explain it to me? Why did you just push me away? You just shoved me away. The Brisa concludes, Liyamim sometime later, it happened that the three converts, those three converts that we talked about, the two of the previous weeks, and the convert that we talk about this week, they all got together. All of those that approached Hillel and approached Shammai, they met up with one another in the same place, and they related to each other their respective stories. Amru, when they were finished, they declared, Kabdunuso shall Shamai, big mina olam. The sternness of Shamai sought to banish us from this world of true devotion to God. But Anvisonuso shall Hillel, Karvenu, Kervanu, Tachas, Kanfe, Hashchina. But the humble and patient manner of Hillel brought us under the wings of the divine presence. Wow. You see the great power? Do we see the incredible awesomeness of Hillel? 
how special Hillel was that he took the plea of this desiring convert where he tells him, come, come, come learn. Yes, we'll convert you, sure. That's the side thing. Let's get closer to God. Let's understand what our purpose is here. And with this, the Talmud here concludes, and that's the end of the story of the converts. But I think there's so many amazing lessons that we can learn here of how we need to treat every single person. Every single person. This is even, uh, now let's do a Kalva Homer again. Let's talk from the light to the more stringent. If we're so cautious with someone who's coming to convert, to give them proper guidance, to to guide them with love and with patience, and not to admonish them, and not to push them away, shouldn't we be even more careful to our own brothers and sisters who don't know? Our own brothers and sisters, I want to make a declaration, I believe firmly that it's our responsibility today Torah observant rabbis, I would love to include myself among those, that we need to go out and share the beauty of Torah with love and with patience. Because if it wasn't, till 200 years ago, you didn't have something called Reformed Judaism. You didn't have something called Conservative Judaism till 60 years ago. But why, why, would, why did they come? Why did they come about? It used to be you were either Shomer Shabbos or not Shomer Shabbos. That was it. But now you have all of these different movements, perhaps, oh, maybe just perhaps, if the Orthodox, the Torah observant rabbis were more open to questions, were more loving, more kind, more patient, maybe they wouldn't, more receptive, maybe they wouldn't have need to start their own fractured movements. Maybe. They wouldn't have needed to start a reform movement and a conservative movement and a reconstructionist movement. The Torah is so beautiful. The Torah is so perfect. The Torah is meant for every Jew. It's meant for every person in the world. We have it. Let's share it with the world. Share it with kindness. Share it with love. Share it in its beauty not to chop it down. You have a question, don't make assumptions. Ask someone. The Torah is perfect. And the minute we understand our responsibility to share that beauty, share that perfection with the world, and not turn people away, and not be with an iron fist, Hashem should bless our ways, that we should merit to see the beauty of the Torah, and always share the beauty of the Torah with everyone that we come in contact with. Amen. Any questions? Yes, let me hear. Yes, we see many, many times that Hillel is the kinder, softer. And, and, and that's, that, that's an amazing thing because you see the same thing with Abraham. Abraham was kindness. The first thing you need, the first virtue you need to represent Judaism is kindness. Isaac was gvura. That's strength. That comes after kindness. First comes the kindness. Then you have to, yes, for certain things, you have to stand, you have to push, you have to push Ishmael away. That's a negative influence. You have to push that away. Yet Asaph, to try to bring him closer, recognize there's a distinction between good and evil. But the first step is always kindness. That needs to be our mantra. A hundred percent. A hundred percent. We need to ensure that anybody who walks into the confines of a synagogue feels welcome, that they feel loved, that they feel appreciated. And you know what? Everybody comes from a different background. Some people come from a Jewish, a very heavily Jewish background. Some people come from not such a Jewish background. I can tell you, I had people come to my synagogue who said they haven't been in a synagogue in 20 years. They grew up religious. They grew up in a Hasidic background and left it. And now is the first time. And that love, that joy, that energy, that excitement, that friendship is what really cultivates and captures people. And that's what we need to make sure we're doing for our our fellow congregants, our fellow brothers and sisters, to bring them in. Not by making things light. You see that Hillel didn't say, you don't have to keep the Torah. You know, as long as you pay your conversion fees, you're good to go. That's not the way it works. 
No, there's a set of rules, and the rules don't change. But there's a way to do it with kindness and with love. All right, my dear friends, have a great Shabbos. It's a real privilege and an honor.